through the night against all the odds. They said it was impossible. He should have come by now. But he arrived precisely when he meant to. The Christmas story started long ago. Before we landed on the moon. Before we ever went to war. Before that special birth in Bethlehem. Before every famine and every flood. Before any person had ever died. A lonely couple who made a choice. Their home was the best place imaginable. But they listened to a serpent who told a lie instead of the God who cared for them. So their first baby and every child since has been born away from home. There was a hint a child from them would make things right. But their first son killed his younger brother. Death entered our broken world and the serpent's lie lived on. But God wasn't done. He sent someone. A great, great, great grandson. A boy who knocked down a giant without a fight. A man who honoured God. A king who cared. But he listened to the lie as well. He killed to steal himself a wife. Some people say that God isn't real, or he doesn't care, or he has lost control. There was another king who thought that way. He and his people were surrounded. Survival seemed impossible. God gave that king one chance, to ask for any sign he wanted, to show that he cared, that he was committed to rescue. The king declined. So God himself chose a sign. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Impossible. We didn't win the fight that day. We never beat the lie. But someone is coming, through the ages, through the night. Though they say it's impossible, when it seemed like all was lost, Jesus came, precisely when he meant to. The Virgin had her child, Emmanuel, the sign that God himself has come to rescue. I don't know about you, but this is the time when people start to get a little anxious about Christmas because maybe you're like me and you haven't finished shopping yet. Anybody, can you confess, anybody hasn't done their Christmas shopping yet? Okay, those of you that finished in July, we hate you, okay? Those of you that finished this summer, you know, there's a word for that, weirdness. No, okay, so we're, we're talking about getting some gifts, right? Because Christmas is all about gifts, and in fact, we're going to talk about the greatest gift there is today. But just in case you need some ideas, okay, just in case you need some inspiration, let me give you from the 2016 Neiman Marcus Fantasy Gift Catalog. Here's some ideas. Okay, for only $30,000, you can give somebody the chance to do a walk-on on a Broadway show. $30,000, and they get to do a walk-on on a one one time basis on a Broadway show. That's pretty cool. Now if you're into reading, you could get 36 Caldecott Medal winning first edition children's books. You get a hundred you get 36 of those for a hundred thousand dollars. That is the best way to, to stock your kids' library. 
okay? Maybe this one is a bit more up your, up your uh, alley. A one-day private quarterback champ, uh, uh, quarterback camp with Joe Montana for only $65,000. You get to spend the day with Joe learning how to be a quarterback. If you like travel, you can get a week stay at three different English estates. You get three weeks. That's only $700,000 for that. Pretty good. Now, here is the, the most expensive gift on the list, a Cobalt Valkyrie X private plane in rose gold for only $1.5 million. So, I wanted to help you out this morning, so I want to give you some gift ideas. As I said, we are going to talk today about what is the greatest gift that we have ever been given. Now, I started this series two Sundays ago on December 4th, and we are using the idea of adventure. The word advent, if you look in your notes, means coming. It is from the Latin adventus. Now, in message one, I talked about how to get ready for advent, how to get ready for the adventure. And I use four words. If you remember that message, I talked about anticipation. You get excited about it, expectant. Preparation, you get everything ready. Celebration, the advent has come. And then declaration, you tell everybody about how great it is. That's what we ought to be doing with Christmas. You ought to be so excited, not just about the tree and not just about the presents, but about the fact that God gave us the greatest gift. And then last week we talked about Jesus came to bring God to us. Now, that's our title today on screen. You'll notice a little flip in the words. Last week, Jesus came to bring God to us so we could understand him. And if you were here last week, I talked about identification, and I talked about incarnation and revelation and transformation because the whole point of Christmas is to change our lives. Now, this morning in message number three, I want to talk about this idea of Jesus coming to this earth so that we could be connected to God. Now, look in your notes just so you remember. The word Advent is there. It means Adventus. It means the arrival of an important person, place, or thing, the approach of something. And so that's what the idea of Christmas is all about. We've used a verse in John chapter 18 kind of as the, as the focal point of this message series. And, okay, and look what he says. We've read it the past two Sundays, so I want you to really understand it. For this purpose, for this reason, I was born, Christmas. For this purpose, for this reason, I've come into the world. That's why Christmas happened. What is it, Jesus? Tell us. To bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Now, contextually... If you want to know where this passage falls in the timeline of Christ's life, this is at the end of his life. This is right before he's going to be crucified. And he's standing before Pilate on trial, and Pilate says to him, what is truth? And, of course, Jesus' classic answer from John 14, 6, he says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, I want you to just circle that entire last statement. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus' purpose in coming was to connect you with God. Now, I want everybody to hear that. Jesus' purpose in coming was to connect you with God. No one comes to the Father. No one is connected to the Father. No one gets to heaven except through me. Jesus made it very clear that the point, the reason, the purpose of his coming was so that we could be connected to the Father. Because just like we saw in that video, there is a big disconnect between us and God because of that thing called sin. And because there was this big, big disconnect, and because there was no way that we could get to God on our own, because let me tell you, just so you understand, everybody look up here. You can go to heaven on your own. You can get to heaven on your own. You can. You just have to be perfect from your first breath to your last breath. See, that's the only, that's the only you know, qualifier is perfection. So you want to get to heaven? You can get there on your own. If you are perfect from that first breath as a baby to that last breath, whatever it is. The problem is, guess what? None of us are what? Perfect. Okay, even when we think we're pretty good, we're not perfect. In fact, the Bible goes on to say that on your best day, doing the best you can, 
your righteousness, your best good deeds are like filthy rags in God's sight. Why? Because God's standard is perfection, and anything less than that is imperfection. Right? I want you to really understand that. Okay, it's just like this. Suppose, ladies, and I've, I've told this story before. Suppose, ladies, your husband's in a very, very generous mood, and he goes out to one of the finest boutiques, one of the finest ladies' apparel stores, and buys you a beautiful white silk blouse. And it is beautiful. It's incredible. It's expensive. And it looks so great on you. And he takes you out to dinner. And while you're at dinner, you are eating an Italian dish, and you drop one little tiny drop of red marinara sauce right here. Anybody ever had that happen? I hate that, don't you? So your beautiful, beautiful blouse, incredible, expensive, impeccable, looks so good on you. There's one little red drop of marinara sauce right here in the front. Now, is that white, beautiful blouse clean or dirty? It's only got a little tiny dot. 99.9% .9 of it is still beautiful and white and pristine. But is it clean or dirty? Is it stained? Yes. And so you ladies are going to go to the ladies' room and try to get something to get it all cleaned up, or you carry that little packet of, of Tide wipes or whatever they are in, in your purse, and, and you're trying to get it. Guys say, hey, forget it. I'll just put a sweater over it. Nobody will ever know. You know, guys don't care about a spot. Come on. Okay? In college, you know, back when I was in college, I would wear the clothes that smelled the least bad. You know what I'm talking about. So, so you're anyway, you're, you're there, and, and you've got the one little drop, but it's still dirty. It's still imperfect. And in God's sight, it does not matter how much sin you have. The fact is we've all sinned, as we're going to look at in just a moment. And so the whole point of Christ's coming, the whole point of Christmas, and I really want you to get this because it can get lost and it can get buried underneath all of the other stuff of Christmas. The purpose is to reconnect us to God. No one comes to the Father. The whole point is getting you to the Father, except through me. Now, I want you to look at a passage on your notes, and it's going to be on screen from 1 Timothy 1.5. Paul writes to Timothy, and he talks about the whole reason of Christmas. Now, they didn't call it Christmas then. It wasn't a national holiday back in the first century. But look at what Paul says, all right? And I want you to read it out loud with me today. We're going to do it in unison. Here we go. This saying is reliable and deserves full acceptance. All right, stop. What saying is that, Paul? What are you talking about? Here's the saying. Let's read it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now, the key word is came because that is what Advent, the coming, is all about. Paul says this statement is is reliable, it's truthful, and everybody should accept it. Full acceptance means everybody should embrace this truth. Jesus Christ came for one purpose, to save sinners. Now let me ask you, does that include you? You better believe it, because I haven't met one perfect person yet, especially when looking in the mirror, I certainly haven't. Jesus Christ came into the world. That's Christmas. That's Advent to save sinners. So if you're taking notes, I want you to just write down this statement. Jesus came to save me. Now, yes, he came to save the world, for God so loved the world. But he came to save you individually, personally, and that's why this message is so important for every person in this room to hear and to respond to. Jesus didn't just come to save everybody, he came to save me. I need you to understand that. For Christmas to have any kind of meaning in your life, you've got to understand this statement. He came to bring us to God. Now, I want you to write down today what I'm calling the four S's of Christmas. Four S words, and I want you to write them down because they're all relevant and they're all practical and they're all applicable to us. All right? Now, the first three are negative, and the last one is positive. Because you've got to understand how bad off we are to understand how good Christmas is. Now, did you get that? You've got to understand how bad off we are to understand how good Christmas is. I think I told you the story before about uh, buying a ring, an engagement ring, 
for my wife in going to a jewelry store in Ridgemar Mall back in 1979. That's how long ago it was. And I didn't have a lot of money. I was in seminary, and I wanted to buy the best ring I could buy. You know how, how we are, guys. So uh, I remember going in. It was called Lynn's Jewelers, L-I-N-Z. Anybody remember that? It's gone now. And I remember sitting down, and they sit you in front of this glass counter, right? And they bring out the diamonds. And this guy was so slick, this salesman. And what they do when they're showing you the, the ring is they have this high-intensity light that could blind you, and they have a piece of black velvet. And what they do is they put the diamond in the light so it shines brightly, especially against the black backdrop. It makes it just really pop, okay? Even a cheapy diamond like I could afford really popped, you know? And the idea of the brightness against the darkness is what really makes it pop. That's the story of Christmas. You have to understand Christmas with the black backdrop. You have to understand Christmas with the backstory that leads up to the manger. And so what I want to do this morning very quickly is to give you these four S words. I want you to write them down, and we're going to talk about them for just a moment. The first one of these, well, let me, let me just read this passage before we get into that, because this is a passage that is very, very important, and it's from Ephesians chapter 2. And look what, look what Paul says, leading us into the S words. He says, at that time, you were apart from Christ. I want you to circle the word apart. You were foreigners and did not belong to God's chosen people. I want you to circle the word foreigners and circle the words did not belong. Okay? Keep reading. You had no part in the covenants. I want you to circle the two words, no part, which were based on God's promises to his people, and you lived in this world without hope and without God. Now, I want you to circle the phrases without hope and without God. Now, look at the backdrop. Look at the black, bleak backdrop of Christmas. You were apart from Christ. You did not belong. You had no part. You were without hope. You were without God. That's black. That's bleak. You see, the whole human condition is what prompted God to send his son. Because God looked down at us, his people, and he said, I don't want them to be a part. He said, I don't want them to be foreigners. I don't want them to not feel like they don't belong to me. He said, I don't want them to have no part. I want them to be involved. I want them to have hope, and I want them to have a relationship with me. And so Paul makes this incredible statement about how bleak it was. And then he says, but now, post-Christmas, because of Christmas. But now because of Christmas, in union with Christ Jesus, you who used to be, say it, far away. That's what we were. You have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought us peace by making Jews and Gentiles one people. With his own body, talking about the cross, he broke down the wall that separated them. You see, there was a wall that separated you from God, a wall of sin. And it kept us his enemies. He abolished the Jewish law with its commandments and rules in order to create out of the two races one new people in union with himself in this way, making peace. Now, let me tell you how great Christmas is. We were without hope, without God, apart, separated. There was this wall that kept us away. And all of these things that, that reinforced the idea that we could never have a connection with God. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so Christ came into this world to make sure that we could know God. He came to save us. And that's the message of Christmas. He came to do everything that we could not do for ourselves. Why do you think Jesus died on a cross as a sacrifice? Because he loves you. Why was he qualified to do that? Because he lived a perfect, sinless life. Remember I said, you want to go to heaven, all you got to do is live a perfect, sinless life from that first breath to that last breath? I'm lucky if I can make it 10 minutes, okay? 
And here it is. Jesus lived that perfect life from first breath to last breath. And he alone could be the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, the unblemished lamb that could actually save us. And so that's why the Christmas story is so important. Jesus came to bring us to God. Now, write these words down. The first one is sinful. Remember, I said the first three are negative and the last one is positive. Guys, you have to understand, if you're ever going to understand the power of Christmas, you have to understand where you stood before God. Now, look at what it says. For everyone has what? Sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. What is the standard? I just said it. The P word. Perfection. Okay, that's the bar. You want to get to heaven? Make it over the bar. Okay? Perfection. But the problem is, Paul writes it there in, in Romans 3.23, everyone has sinned. Everyone including you, including me. We've sinned in our thoughts. We've sinned in our deeds. We've sinned in our words. We've sinned in our attitudes. We all have sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. And as I said, on your best day, doing the best that you can, your best deeds in God's sight are still as filthy rags because it's not a matter of how good you are. It's a matter of whether you're perfect or not. Okay? You see, there is a very important biblical word. I want you to know it's, it's a theological word. If you go to seminary, some of our guys here are in seminary, you're going to study theological uh, tr terms, and one of those is depravity. Have you ever heard depravity before? Depraved, depravity. And the best definition of depravity, depravity means that you are, are sinful, by the way. You're wicked, evil, whatever you want to use. The best definition of depravity that I've ever heard came from Chuck Swindoll, who's the pastor at Stonebriar Church in Frisco. And Chuck Swindoll says, depravity doesn't mean you're as bad as you can be. Because certainly, there are a lot of nice people that aren't as bad as they could be. I mean, you're not like a Saddam Hussein, or you're not like one of the, the Hitlers of the world, or the Neros of the world in history that killed hundreds and thousands of people. You're not like that. You're not as bad as you can be. What depravity means, and get this, it's so important, is you're as bad off as you can be. Now get that. It's not you're as bad as you could be. You could be a lot worse. I'm not advocating that. But what depravity means and what this passage means is you're as bad off as you can be because one sin disqualifies you as much as a million sins disqualifies you. Because the standard that we have to attain to get to heaven on our own is perfection. So everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. Look at this next passage. We are all infected and impure with what? Sin. Stay with me. We're all infected. We're all impure. We got this terminal disease. And even when we display our righteous deeds, I mentioned this verse before, they are nothing but filthy rags. So even if you're religious, even if you go to church, even if you're nice, even if you let the little blue-haired lady in front of you in the grocery store, even if you are kind to of kitty cats and puppy dogs, even if you're just a really overall nice person, you still have a problem because you're still sinful. That's the backdrop of Christmas. Okay? That's the bleak backdrop we have to understand. Now... Because we're sinful, everybody track this with me. Don't lose me on this, this message here. Because the next S word is separated. Because we are sinful, we are separated from God. Look at this passage, Isaiah 59, 2. It is your sins that what? Separate you from your God. You see, because I've sinned, because you've sinned, we've got a huge problem, and that is that we are separated from God. Okay? And it's not a little bit of a separation that we can kind of just jump over. We're talking like a Grand Canyon-wide separation, chasm, gulf between us and God. Anybody ever been to the Grand Canyon? Raise your hand if you've been there. 
Okay, you get real close to the parameter of the Grand Canyon, and it in certain places is not just feet and yards, but in certain places it's miles across. So I said, okay, this morning we're going pri- to uh, charter a private jet. We're all going to climb aboard. We're going to fly out to the Grand Canyon. We're all going to stand on the perimeter of the Grand Canyon, and we're all going to try to jump across. Okay, now get it in your head. We're there at the perimeter of the Grand Canyon, and we're all on the edge. We've climbed over the, the fence or the chains to keep us out, and we're going to say, okay, we're going to let the Godfather, Junior, go first. Okay, we're going to let Junior go first. But listen, here's what's going to happen. We're standing there, and we're going to jump. Now, some of you may get 10 feet. Some of you may really get, get, get a good start, get 15 feet, 20 feet. But guess what? It is too big of a separation. It's too big of a gulf to get across on your own. This is what the Bible means. You cannot get to God on your own. You're sinful and you're separated and the chasm, the gulf is so wide, it is so huge that there is no way we can bridge that gap on our own. It's humanly impossible. That's why there's Christmas. Because God did for us what we can't do for ourselves. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's the bridge between where we are and where God is. That's good news. Look at the next passage. Remember, at that time, you were separated from Christ. And the Amplified Bible makes it even clearer what the Greek is implying there. You were excluded from any relationship with him. That's bad news. So we're sinful and we're separated. Remember, we're talking about the bleak, black backdrop of this great story. Because in order to understand how much Christmas is good news, you have to understand how much bad news we had to live with. Word number three, I want you to write this down. Because we're sinful and we're separated, the Bible makes a declaration that we are in fact, sentenced. We have consequences that we have to face. We're sinful, everybody in here. I mean, you look so nice and shiny and Christmassy this morning, but you're just sinful, just like I am. And we're separated from God, and we're sentenced. Now, what does that mean? That means that sin carries with it a penalty. Sin carries with it a consequence. It's just like if you break the law, you have to face the consequence. There is a fine, a penalty, a punishment for breaking the law, right? We know that. And so it is with us. Because biblically, the Bible says this, the person who sins will what? Now, let me ask you a question. Why do you think Adam and Eve ultimately died? Because they sinned. You see, I really believe, I believe this with all my heart. If Adam and Eve never sinned, God had designed us to live forever. You see, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God when they sinned, they That choice ushered into the world all kinds of consequences, and one of the consequences was that they were going to, in fact, die. In fact, I would go even further to say that I believe that if Adam and Eve had never sinned, there would not be any kind of an aging process. I think the whole process of aging and getting old and getting weak and getting frail and ultimately kind of dying is all a consequence of sin. Adam and Eve were created in the prime of their life. They were created in youth and vitality, and I really believe if they had not sinned that they and everybody that ever lived on this planet would live a life of youth and vitality and and wellness and health and all that stuff. But what did sin do? Sin ushered into the world a penalty, a consequence, a punishment of death. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way. The person who sins will die. Now, let me tell you what this means. Because it has a twofold meaning. One is 
because of sin being ushered into the world, every human that ever lived is going to face a physical death. Every human that ever lives is going to face a physical death. Okay? Sometimes it happens when you're older and you get sick and you just kind of wither away and die. Sometimes it's very tragic and it happens when you're young and there may be an accident or a disease process or whatever that happens. But every person on this planet, you're thinking, man, Pastor Chuck's really giving me a lot of encouragement today. Man, it's a week before Christmas. He's really, really building me up. Listen, you've got to understand how bad it is to understand how good it is. And everybody here at some point is going to die physically unless Jesus comes again before that happens. Now, the implication of the passage is not just a physical death, but a spiritual death. Because there are really two kinds of deaths that we human face. One is the physical death where our human body is stops functioning, stops breathing, the brain stops sending signals, the heart stops beating, and we are pronounced dead. But there is a more profound death that every person faces, and that is a spiritual death, which is eternal, total separation from God forever. And that is what is implied in this passage. The person that sins, yeah, they're going to die physically, but even worse, they're going to die spiritually because they do not have a relationship with God. The whole reason Jesus came was because we were sinful and we were separated and we lived with this death sentence and he didn't want us to die that second death. Look at this next passage. When people sin, they earn what sin pays. Death. Spiritual, physical. One more. Same passage, different translation. For the wages of sin is death. Now, guys, let me tell you something. I want to give you the absolute truth from my heart this morning. Everybody in this room, me included and me first, sinful, separated, and sentenced. We deserve death, physical and spiritual, because we sinned before God. And that is the bleak, black backdrop of the Christmas story. Because it was in that place that Jesus came. In fact, it says in the book of Isaiah that the people who walked in darkness will see a great light. The darkness represents the sin, the separation, and the sentence that is on humankind. And Jesus Christ came into the world so that he could, in fact, here's the word, save us. Yeah, we're sinful. Yeah, we're separated. Yeah, we're sentenced. But you know what the good news of Christmas is? We can be saved. We can be saved from that. Have you ever watched any, any kind of movie where there are guys on death row and they're waiting for the call of clemency from the governor or from the president? They're waiting for somebody to call and, and stop the electric chair from, from executing the person. And, and everybody in the movie, they're waiting to see if he's going to be pardoned, if he's going to be saved. You see, can we put it this way? boys and girls, young people, men and women that are here, we are all on death row. We're all on death row. We're sinful. We're separated. We're in isolation. And we're on death row. We're sentenced. And when Jesus Christ came into this world at Christmas, guess what? He brought a pardon. He brought forgiveness. He came to save us. Now, look at how the Bible describes it. But now, at this very moment, look at it. In Christ Jesus, you who once were so very, what are the words? Far away from God. You have been brought near by the blood of Christ. I don't know about you, but that is incredible news. I don't have to face death row. I don't have to face an eternal separation with God. And can I name it? I don't have to go to a place called hell because Jesus Christ came at Christmas for me. That is the best news you will ever hear in this life. Look at the next passage. Same passage, different version. But now you belong to Christ. When you receive him as your Savior, think about that. At one time, you are far away from God, and now you've been brought close to him, and Christ did this for you. 
when he gave his blood on the cross. Now, let me tell you something. Look up here. There would be no cross without a manger. That's why Christmas is so important. You see, there would be no sacrificial death of Jesus dying and bleeding and hanging on that cross if he had first not been born as that baby in Bethlehem. So the reason why the birth of Christ is so important is because it was part of God's eternal plan to save you. He had to become a human being and live that perfect life and die that sacrificial death on the cross so that he could be your Savior. That's the good news of Christmas. You know what? You're sinful. So am I. You're separated from God. So am I. You're sentenced because of that. I am too. But guess what? We can all be saved because of what Christ did. Look at the next passage. 1 Peter 3.18. Christ himself suffered when he died for you. Have you ever thought about the fact that Mary's sitting there in that manger that stable, that cave, whatever it was in Bethlehem. And she's holding that newborn baby close to her as mothers do. And she leans down and she kisses him on his brow, his forehead. She takes his little hand in hers and she lifts it and, and kisses his tiny little hand. You, all of you moms know what that's about. It's that same little baby soft hand that one day had a nail go through it. It was that same soft hand forehead that had, had those thorns and the crown of thorns thrust in his skull. You see, you can't separate the manger from the cross. They're inseparable. Because even when the angel came to Joseph and reassured him that he should go ahead and take Mary to be his wife, he said, the baby that is inside of her is from the Holy Spirit, for he is going to come and save his people from their sins. At the very beginning of his life, Christ had one agenda, to end up on the cross. The cross was no accident. The cross was not an afterthought. The cross was not a whoops. The cross was part of God's eternal, intentional plan for us. He was not guilty. Look at the passage. But he died for people who are guilty. That's us. He did this to bring what? All of you to God. Isn't that amazing? The reason why Jesus came was so that he could bring you to God because guess what? You were sinful and you were separated and you were sentenced, but now you can be saved. Look at this passage. Same one in the New Living. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. Isn't that a great, great picture? You know? Think about that song, I'll be home for Christmas. Guess what? Because of Jesus, we're going to be in our eternal home because of Christmas. We're going to be home with him because of Christmas. I mean, one of the great, coolest things about Christmas is reuniting with loved ones. Isn't that great? Somebody's been, I, I tell you, I just got to, I got to say this. I don't want to embarrass you. I'm so glad Robert Barbosa is back with us safely from Afghanistan and the Middle East. Robert's back. Thank you, Robert. We love you. I tell you, when we have a, a man like that serving our country, being deployed, not being with his family for about six or seven months, the homecoming is so sweet. It's so precious. It's so wonderful. I know how much he missed his kids, and I know how much they missed, uh, they missed him, their dad, and how much Maria missed him. And, and think about that homecoming. Think about your homecoming. You were sinful, separated, sentenced. You're on death row, and God welcomes you home because of what Christ you see, Advent, the coming, is only understood if you realize that his coming was so that he could bring you to God because he loves you. 